I'm Jessica Hilton, co-president of the Berkeley High School Development Group. We are very excited and honored to host the following conversation with Professor Jennifer Doudna, the co-discoverer of the gene editing technology CRISPR, and Glenn Wokenfeld, a superstar biology teacher at BHS. The Berkeley High School Development Group is an independent nonprofit created by a group of parents concerned about school funding cuts. With the support of donors and community members like you, the development group has become a vital source of funding for Berkeley High School. Donations received sustain programs that enrich the experience of every student, such as after school tutoring, technology in the classrooms, field trips, the College Career Center, and much more. In the upcoming months, the development group will provide a range of funding to BHS, especially for distance learning, including Chromebooks and remote tutoring programs. This is a critical time, and we hope you will consider making a donation by visiting bhsdg.org. Thank you. We will start our exciting conversation with Jennifer Dalna, but before we do, I'd like to thank our local sponsors who provide a critical component of our annual funding. This includes North Berkeley Wealth Management, Magoosh Online Test Prep, Ferrari Orthodontics, Bear Corporation, B.B. McRae and Alexis Thompson of Grubco, and Peter Shelton Law. These long-term partners of BHS DG understand the importance of providing a high-quality education for all students in order for them to be leaders of tomorrow. As an intro, Jennifer Dowden has been on the faculty at UC Berkeley since 2002 with a focus on structural biology and biochemistry of RNA. She completed her graduate and postdoc at Harvard and University of Colorado. And now to our conversation with Jennifer Doudna and Glenn Wolkenfeld. Well, Professor Doudna, I, I wanna tell you how uh, uh, grateful the entire community is to you for having um, you join us for this event. And as a biology teacher, I wanna tell you how particularly thrilled I am to be able to talk to you in person. Um, so over the course of this interview, we're gonna talk about CRISPR, why it's such an important breakthrough. We're also gonna talk about how your work relates to the ongoing COVID-19 crisis and look at some of the ethical issues connected to CRISPR. But let's start with some of the very basics. Um, let's pretend that we were doing a video conference with my ninth grade biology class and you were the guest speaker. You're in front of a group of ninth graders. How would you explain CRISPR to them? Well, I think I'd explain it uh, the way I explained it to my neighbor once, which is uh, that it's, it's, a, it's a tool for changing the code of life in cells or organisms, and it comes from bacteria. It comes from a bacterial immune system that allows bacteria to identify and destroy viruses and do it in real time. And the cool thing about this immune system called CRISPR is that just like our own immune system, it learns. It learns over time. So when it encounters a new virus, it creates a little memory of the virus. And then if the virus shows up in the cell again, it gets destroyed. And so this is a pathway that uh, uh, just really a handful of scientists were studying about 10 to 15 years ago. And, uh, and then uh, what happened was that uh, it, it came to light that this uh, this virus uh, immune system, this antivirus system called CRISPR, can actually be used to make changes in DNA because of the way it works. And that's really where my lab came in, because I'm a, I'm a biochemist. I'm somebody who figures out how molecules work, and we were studying how the molecules of CRISPR work. And once we understood that, we recognized that it could be repurposed as a tool for changing uh, the genetic code, the DNA in plants and animals. And that's really what's happened over the last eight years is that this has now become a global, a globally used technology that's opening the door, not only for understanding very fundamental questions about the genetics of organisms, but also giving scientists the tool they can use to correct disease causing mutations in humans, in plants, uh, and also do things like introduce new kinds of traits into organisms. So it's become a, a very powerful tool for lots of different things. Okay. Um, just to continue on that same thread, 
Can you tell us some stories about how CRISPR is already changing people's lives? Um, we've looked at things like um, how CRISPR has been used as a cure for a genetic form of blindness or how there are potential applications related to sickle cell disease. Can you tell us some more about that? Sure. So this is one of the things that I get so excited about is thinking about how fundamental research can actually become a tool that helps people in their daily life. So imagine that in the not too distant future, we have a way to treat somebody that has a genetic disease, something they're born with, mm -hmm. um, something that's in their DNA. If we had a way to change their DNA so they don't suffer from that disease anymore. I mean, that would just be amazing. I mean, that's something that, you know, humans have never had that uh, capability until now. And so with, with sickle cell disease, this is the disease that, um, that causes the red blood cells in somebody affected with this disorder to be sickled. They're literally, you know, instead of being nice round cells that get through capillaries in the body easily, they have a, a curved kind of sickly shape to them and they end up getting stuck in, in blood vessels and they end up causing all kinds of problems for, for the people that are affected. And all of that stems from one, imagine, one base pair in DNA, one letter in the, uh, the entire code in a, an affected person's DNA that's wrong, you know, that means to, not wrong, but, you know, it, it's causing the disease. And so uh, this is what CRISPR could do. We know that in the laboratory, we're able to correct that, uh, that disease-causing mutation so that the cells are normal. And so now the, the plan is to take that technology that works in the laboratory and turn it into an actual clinical therapy, which of course requires things like getting it into the right cells and making sure that it's safe, of course, and then of course that it's effective. So that's really where the field is currently, is um, starting to do the kind of clinical testing that will then be necessary to see CRISPR go from a, a, a cool tool in the lab to being an actual treatment that a doctor could prescribe if somebody needs it. So just to follow up on this, um, if a baby were diagnosed in utero or shortly after birth as having been born with sickle cell, then this is a treatment that could happen early on in life, and this person could potentially be symptom-free on account of this treatment. That's right, because it's a treatment that, that, um, that corrects the, the cause of the disease at the source. It goes right to the, 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 base, the most basic cause, which is in the DNA in this case, and makes, makes a correction. So it, it could really uh, impact people's lives from the very beginning if we knew that they had this, this disease. And, and I'd imagine that there must be a host of other diseases like cystic fibrosis, hemophilia, things like that, that could be similar targets for CRISPR-related therapies. Absolutely. Muscular dystrophy is a, another one that people are thinking about. So there are a whole list of, of diseases that have a single gene that is the known cause of the mm -hmm. disease that could be uh, fixed using CRISPR. Okay. Um, let's shift to uh, something that's on everybody's mind. Um, you were recently profiled in the news for setting up a COVID-19 testing lab. Can you start by telling us about some of your efforts related to COVID-19 testing? Sure. So first of all, uh, COVID-19 is a disease that's caused by a virus. I think everybody is aware of that. And, and the virus is an RNA virus. So I think your students know that, uh, that you know, there are two kinds of genetic material. There's DNA that we're familiar with, but then there's also a, a cousin of DNA called RNA. And, um, and, and for this particular virus that causes COVID-19, it's a it's an RNA virus. It's a piece of, uh, you know, genetic material that comes in a little package that's able to infect uh, people. And uh, for those that get very severely infected and get a, get a severe uh, disease, this COVID-19 disease, they actually get infected in their lung cells. And that causes a lot of inflammation and just, just you know, difficulty breathing and things like that. So it's clearly a very, a very bad virus. And so uh, when this virus was emerging back in, in January and February, a lot of us uh, scientists you know, here in Berkeley were watching with some uh, real concern about you know, what was happening in Asia and kind of you know, thinking about, well, what's gonna happen when this virus begins to infect a lot of people in America? 
And so in, uh, in early March, I started to think about how we as scientists could quickly try to address the pandemic. And it seemed like one of the most urgent things that needed to happen was an expansion of testing. So the ability to detect the RNA from this coronavirus and be able to tell people you've either got this virus or you don't. That's the, sort of the most basic, uh, important health information right now in this pandemic for people to know are they infected or not. And then in the future to be able to do what we call surveillance testing, basically being able to test people who don't have symptoms, but to be able to tell them you've been exposed to the virus or you haven't. Um, and so they have some feeling, hopefully, of safety about you know, being able to monitor this. And we hope eventually help the state of California and the country get back to work and back to school and uh, back to our normal lives. And so we, we set up a testing, we decided in the middle of March that we were going to rapidly set up a clinical testing lab at UC Berkeley. And this is kind of an amazing thing because clinical labs have to have, they have to have, you know, they have to be associated with typically with a medical center. Uh, Berkeley does not have a medical school on its campus. So we had to figure that out. We're actually working with our student health center. And uh, we had to quickly figure out how to not only do the science necessary to detect the virus, which is actually, we knew very well how to do that, but uh, we had to get all the other parts in place, like how are we going to meet all of the state and federal requirements for a testing lab? How are we going to get access to patient samples? Mm -hmm. How are we going to manage the data and report the data accurately back to physicians? And so that's what I've been working really, really hard on over the last few weeks. And I'm proud to say that we have an extraordinary team at Berkeley and with all of our partners through the Innovative Genomics Institute. It's included people from UCSF, the BioHub there, uh, the, the, uh, you know, some local companies, some other affiliated labs, and a whole collection of, of scientists and, and other people with the right expertise got together and we're able to create the, this clinical lab. And so we're now operational. We're, we're now testing uh, samples from our Berkeley community as well as people elsewhere. We we're working with homeless shelters in the East Bay. We're working with uh, nursing homes and assisted living facilities. We're actually also working with the Berkeley Fire Department. So we've been testing fire, firefighters uh, because they, as first responders, you can imagine they get exposed or they might be more at risk of getting exposed than other people. And so this has been an, an amazing way for our students and all of our affiliated scientists and faculty, et cetera, our staff to be uh, contributing in this time of, of emergency. Great. Um, moving out to a slightly longer term view, is there a possibility that CRISPR might play a role as an antiviral therapy, for example, providing people with some of the protection that their immune systems might not be able to provide them with until we have a vaccine. Yeah, well, I think that's an interesting possibility because it is a system that works exactly for that purpose in, in bacteria. So some scientists are asking, you know, can we take that, that bacterial immune system and just use it to bolster our own immunity against the virus? And, and you know, I think the short answer is that, that Technically, that can work for sure, and it works, works in the laboratory. What makes it difficult right now to see how that could quickly be used in a therapeutic way is that uh, we have to figure out how to get those CRISPR molecules into a patient cell, right? right? We have to figure out how to, if it's a lung cells, we have to figure out how to get it into the lung. Um, and if it, once it gets there, for it to be effective against the virus, we need it to get into every every infected cell. So that's, a, that's kind of a tall order. But nonetheless, I think there's a lot of interest in this because uh, even if it doesn't uh, come about for this particular pandemic, we know this isn't the last time that you know, we're going to be facing uh, viruses. And you know, they emerge every year in the form of influenza and, and, of course, other types of viruses like coronaviruses, which is what, this, uh, what causes COVID-19. So I think there's, there's lots of interest in developing CRISPR in that direction, even if it doesn't uh, come together quite in time for this particular pandemic. Got it. Um, moving into a slightly broader view, um, you've done breakthrough work about gene editing, and gene editing raises all sorts of ethical questions and concerns about potential abuse, questionable 
applications, and some of those have already come to pass. Um, how have you played a role in, in addressing some of those concerns, and what are some of the safeguards that are being discussed so that as this technology unfolds, it gets unfolded in a wise way? Well, back in 2014, I, I, you know, I, I, um, I saw a publication from a lab that was using CRISPR in monkeys and using it in monkey embryos and then make, so making changes to the monkey DNA and then mm -hmm. taking those edited embryos and implanting them into a, a monkey mom. And, and uh, she gave birth to you know, CRISPR edited uh, monkeys. And it was kind of one of those things where, on the one hand, it was, you know, crazy to see something that, you know, right before that would have felt like or seemed like complete science fiction actually happening and being done. But the other thought I had immediately was, well, if it works in monkey embryos, then there's no reason to think it wouldn't work in human embryos. And maybe there are scientists somewhere who already think that would be a neat thing to try. And... Um, so that really, really got me, uh, got me working with my colleagues initially at Berkeley, but then elsewhere as well, to think about how we as scientists could make a strong statement about a powerful technology and kind of lead the way towards uh, an open, transparent, worldwide, um, some kind of, you know, at least conversation and then eventually consensus about the safe and ethical use of genome editing, and so I've been involved in that now for you know several years, and um, and I think uh, many folks listening to this uh, discussion will maybe be aware of uh, some work that was announced with the uh, you know that that resulted in uh, what are widely known as CRISPR babies, uh, you know, children that were born in China that where this kind of work had been done um, it, while they were uh, you know while they were uh, embryos, you know, where genetic changes were made. And, and the thing to appreciate about that kind of application, that kind of use of CRISPR, is that it's very different from what we talked about when we talked about uh, treating a patient with sickle cell disease. Because when, that, when, when you use CRISPR on an individual, it changes the DNA in their cells, but not in uh, cells of their kids. But what we're talking about when you make changes in an embryo or an eggs or sperm, now we're talking about making heritable changes. So these are changes that get passed on to future generations. So it's a much more profound use of the technology that has all sorts of, you know, long-term implications, ethical uh, challenges, who decides, who, 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 who monitors the health of, of people that might receive those sorts of changes, um, on and on. So, you know, I've taken a pretty strong stand on this, and I, I feel very strongly that, you know, this type of, that uh, use of, of CRISPR should not happen right now. And I'm, I'm proud to say that, you know, I think that th there's been a really uh, strong, um, uh, you know, participation of the international community in this type of action. So we're now seeing that the World Health Organization has gotten involved, the UN has gotten involved, some of the very mo the most uh, respected scientific societies have gotten involved. And so there's now quite a, a large cohort of, of scientists around the world who are speaking out about this and, um, and really trying to make sure that as this technology continues to advance and it's moving very fast, you know, that we are using it thoughtfully and using it in ways that we'll be proud of in the future. And it sounds like the clear line for you is germline editing, bad, somatic cell editing, okay. Is that basically the way it breaks down? Today, yes. I, I think we have to be open to the possibility that in the future there could be uses of germline editing in humans that we might consider to be right. So, for example, um, if, you had, if you had absolute confidence that technically the uh, kind of editing that you were intending to do was safe and would help someone's health over their entire life, if you had that knowledge and, you know, getting it is a different question. But if you suppose you were confident in that, then you could argue that there might be cases where it would almost be unethical not to use it, you know, to help someone, right? So I'm open-minded in that way. I don't, I don't think we can just put a, you know, we can say we'll never ever do this. And also, I think realistically, um, this will be used in, in human embryos in the future. It's just a question of when and how, and making sure that it's done in a way that is responsible and always first and foremost thinking about 
someone's life, you know, health, health and livelihood and not doing it for, you know, some other purpose, like to make money or to be famous. I hope it's correct to say that you've broken through uh, glass ceilings that can get in the way of women in the sciences. And can you tell us a little bit about how you did that? I grew up in a small town in Hawaii and I didn't have any, any, I didn't have anybody in science in my family. My, my family was, you know, they were, they were academics. Uh, my dad was on the faculty at the University of Hawaii, but uh, he and my mom were both in, in the social, the, the uh, humanities. You know, my dad was a, a literature uh, professor. He liked to read books and you know, my mom was a historian. And uh, so for me, you know, I just, I was just always drawn to, to science and uh, I loved math when I was growing up. I loved, loved doing puzzles. And, you know, I, I was um, always fascinated by the, the, you know, kind of different, really cool animals and plants that had evolved to survive and, and thrive really in, in that, in, you know, environment in Hawaii. And so I, you know, I decided to pursue um, uh, my, my scientific interests when I went to college. I, I was a chemistry major with a focus on biochemistry, which, you know, in those days was a hot new thing. Now it kind of sounds old fashioned, but, you know, um, it was the, really the study, kind of the application of chemistry to life, you know, understanding the, the chemical properties of molecules that make uh, us the way we are and make cells behave the way they do. And, you know, I always found those questions to be extremely interesting. And um, I never, you know, I didn't really have a plan in mind. You know, I didn't, I didn't think, oh, I want to become a professor at Berkeley someday. I just thought I want to do cool science and I want to do it with fun people. And so I always kind of look for ways to, to maximize that. And, um, you know, I was, when I was younger, I never, you know, I was, I would be invited occasionally to join, you know, like the Association for Women in Science and things like that. And I, maybe I'm a little embarrassed to admit, but I, I was never really very active in those groups because I always thought of myself as, I just thought, well, I'm just a scientist. Like, I'm not a woman in science. I'm just, you know, just doing science and, you know. And, uh, and then it wasn't really till I got older and, you know, I, I started to, to, um, kind of see really more once I got a little farther in my professional career, you know, when I become a faculty, I'd already become a professor, that I started to realize that there were lots of ways in which the system that we're in for doing uh, academic science, but frankly, for doing science and companies too, is, um, you know, can hold women back. And it's not, not necessarily intended that way. It's just that that's how it is. And partly it's because of uh, women, you know, our biology, right? We, we were the ones that had the kids and, you know, our bodies, you know, we have to go through pregnancy and all that. So there's that piece of it. But I think it's also a cultural thing. I think that for many uh, girls and women, and I, I would say this is true about me too, that uh, we're, we're sort of culturally, you know, there's an expectation about our behavior and it's different from the way men behave. We're, we're expected, I think, to be less aggressive uh, in general, and um, maybe not to speak up as much, and not to be not to be as as sort of um, persistent about what we want. And and uh, it's not true across the board for sure. But I think this is something I, I've observed over my, in myself and and just in, in the students I've worked with over the years. And so I think that, you know, that means that there's certain ways that we need to just encourage um, everyone, but certainly women and girls, to feel enabled and feel empowered and feel like their voice is heard. And so I certainly do a lot now in my, in my own teaching and you know, working with people in my laboratory to try to make sure that everyone feels empowered to speak up and, you know, that uh, their opinion is respected and um, you know, that we, we give very, everybody a voice because I think it all starts with feeling like you are, like you're respected, you know, and I, I have to say that I, I give a lot of credit to some people, some of my mentors early on in my uh, education who did that for me. You know, they really showed me that uh, they actually valued my opinion about something. And I can re still remember a few times when I was shocked, you know, some famous professor would be asking for my opinion about an idea they had or a paper they read. And I thought, wow, they really care about what I have to say. They must think that I have something to contribute. And that was very meaningful for me. So I really try to do that now with my students. Along those lines, many of the people who are gonna be watching this are parents in the Berkeley community. And I wonder what advice you have for those parents if they're interested in 
promoting their kids exploring STEM-related learning and STEM-related careers? I think just, you know, I think to me, everybody is um, or has the potential to be a scientist. You know, if you're a, if you're a person who's curious and interested in the world, uh, that's really what a scientist is and does. It's like, you know, it's a, it's a, um, it's a question and answer career. And, and I think that uh, the more that we can just encourage kids to pursue their natural curiosities, to, um, you know, to think that science is cool, it's not uncool, it's cool, and and um, and then you know just really um, looking for ways to um, to help people to gravitate towards what they are naturally passionate about. I've noticed again over the years, uh, and it's true with, in my own family, but it's also true in my my laboratory and my my classroom that. Um, you know, what I, I think my, my most important job actually with what I do is just to help people help themselves, right? To figure out what it is that they personally find exciting, what they're good at doing. And boy, when you get that right, uh, magic happens. People do just amazing things when they, you know, have opportunities to pursue their passions and do things that they're naturally really good at doing. Well, as a teacher, that resonates a lot with me, and I really appreciate it uh, hearing from, from you. Um, let's move back to CRISPR a little bit. Um, CRISPR is, even though the development of it has been running over, over decades now, um, it's still as a technology in its very earliest stages. So if you had a scientific crystal ball, what do you think might be some breakthroughs that might be related to CRISPR in the medium and the very long term? I think we'll see a lot of interesting applications in agriculture. I think we're going to see plants that uh, have traits that are desirable that can be now introduced. Those traits can be introduced without making random changes in plant DNA, but they can be done in a very accurate and targeted way. That's really what CRISPR enables. And so why would this be important? Well, um, as I think all of our students know that we're, you know, the world is facing a real challenge of climate change, and we need to think about, you know, how we're going to feed everybody, how we're going to use less water, at least in certain settings, how we're going to make food more nutritious for people. These are all things that I think CRISPR will have a big impact on, and there's lots of, lots of activity right now in, um, in, you know, using CRISPR in all sorts of, of different kinds of plants and crops. So that's one area. And then another is, um, I think that, um, you know, we've already talked about biomedical uses and I'm excited about that. I think the issue there to me, the big, the big challenge is, you know, even beyond the technical is how do we make this technology widely available? Like I, you know, as a scientist, I don't, I don't want to be creating something that's only affordable to the, you know, 1% or 0.1%. I think we need to be actively thinking as scientists about how we conduct our work in the lab so that our technologies become affordable and sustainable and, and you know, and that that happens in, in a realistic timeline. So that's something that I work on a lot right now and with my colleagues is really encouraging that type of, of thinking. And, uh, and then I guess the third piece is um, I think that in uh, you know in sort of areas where biological organisms like let's say algae or bacteria uh, yeast can be used to produce chemicals that are important for human populations i think we'll see crispr having a big impact there as well because it's a way that we can put uh, genes into uh, organisms where they can then use those genes to make proteins, for example, that are useful, again, in medicine, or they can be useful in, uh, in company, for companies and for technology, and to do it in a way that is um, um, respectful of the environment. Okay. Well, we're going to go very broad, and then we're going to come back to our community. So in terms of going broad, um, E.O. Wilson, the very famous biologist, has talked about our species being at a kind of bottleneck period. We sort of need to make it through this very, very delicate next couple of years. And it seems like humanity is somewhat of an inflection point. We have these amazing technologies like CRISPR, internet, computing, but the overall trend line for our planet and our species isn't necessarily going in the right direction. 
Are you hopeful and why or why not? I'm hopeful. I'm, I'm, I'm an, but I'm an eternal optimist. You know, I, for me, the glass is always half full. Um, I think that uh, I, I, feel, um, I feel encouraged by human ingenuity, creativity. I, you know, I work at a public university uh, here in Berkeley that is uh, the world's best, you know, and, and, and why is it the best? Well, it's the best because we attract the best uh, students and faculty from everywhere, from every walk of life, and they all come together to do interesting work. And so uh, that I take a lot of, a lot of uh, comfort from that. I think that, you know, there's a lot of good in the world and that we, uh, we, we're seeing human beings stepping up to the challenge. We're seeing it right now with COVID-19 and we'll see it for other, other challenges too. Um, but I think that, you know, we have, to, we have to continually be reminding ourselves about the responsibilities that we have. I think each of us as, as human beings, you know, we have, each of us has a unique set of, set of, uh, of, of talents and that each of us, to the extent possible, should try to use our talents to make the world a better place. Good. I'm an optimist too, and it's good to hear that coming from you as well. I've been lucky enough to have uh, your own kid as my student in my classroom, and I know that uh, you've sent your own kids, therefore, to Berkeley High School. Um, I can't imagine having, I can't imagine doing my job at Berkeley High School without the support of foundations like the development group. And I'm curious about why you think it's important for our community to support the Berkeley High School Development Group? I think, you know, there are many, many examples where communities that step up and support the public schools do better in every way. You know, they do better whether it's, uh, you know, through their, um, you know, their uh, population of people that are educated, that are able to, you know, uh, create and take jobs in the community, it supports the economy, it supports the, you know, public health, uh, basically everything. So. I couldn't agree more. I think, you know, the, and this is one of the things that actually uh, my husband and I thought was very attractive about the public schools in Berkeley and Berkeley High in particular is that there's a very active development group, Berkeley, uh, Berkeley High Development Group, that is um, using funds that are collected from the community to do all sorts of really important things, whether it's supporting tutoring for kids, whether it's purchasing Chromebooks for them to use, um, you know, outside of the classroom on and on. There's so many important uses of those funds. And, and it's really, really great that a lot of people in Berkeley recognize the importance of contributing. And just to piggyback onto that, you know, I've spent, I think, close to 30 years as a teacher in Berkeley Unified School District at Berkeley High School. And I've had so much freedom and so much support from this community. So I'm really grateful to you for making this plug for the Berkeley High School Development Group because it's enabled teachers like myself to really have tremendous careers in, in, in our district. So thank you very much for doing that. Wow, That's well thank great. you. I mean, yeah, we, we, we owe you, all of you, big time. I, I, you have a, hard, a very hard job. <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't be able to do your job, I don't think. You know, you have a very hard job and you do it really well. And you know, I, I just, I think that we all owe you a lot because, you know, it requires incredible dedication to be, uh, you know, standing up every day and having creative ideas and, you know, challenging kids and, and being challenged by them and, you know, making sure that, you know, as you said earlier, each, each student has their own personality, their own interests, their own needs. And I see this, you know, at the college and, and graduate level, but you see it at a stage that's really, you know, important for their initial uh, formation as you know, as they're becoming adults. Yeah, and you know, I've spent pretty much my entire professional life at Berkeley High School, and I can't really imagine another school where I would have um, rather have done that. So uh, thank you for your support, and, wow. and you know, yeah. thanks to the whole community. Professor Dowd, now I want to thank you so much for taking time from what must be an incredibly busy schedule to uh, talk to our community, to talk about some of the great things that the Berkeley High School Development Group is doing. We're really indebted to you both for your work for our community and for your work in general with CRISPR, helping us through the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you very, very much. Thank you for hosting me. It was a really interesting conversation and keep up the great work. Really appreciate it, sure. I hope you enjoyed this fascinating conversation. Again, I'd like to thank all of our sponsors and the many individuals that provide funding to the Berkeley High Development Group. 
please consider donating today. Thank you.